To be accepted by the most prestigious media, such as TV, network TV, our messages themselves will have to be, at least initially, both subtle in purpose and crafty in construction. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today, I want to get into a book that I mentioned last week called After the Ball. And the subtitle is How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 1990s. And as I mentioned before, this was written by two Harvard grads who were both gay, uh, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen. And I I read the book, it's, uh, it's out of print, but and it's a very large book, but basically it's a, a a manifesto on how to get American society to accept homosexual behavior as normal. So it's it's this sort of uh, it's almost like the communist manifesto, but a, a gay manifesto to normalize homosexual behavior in America. And I want to go through the kind of points that really jumped out to me in the book. But before I get to that, I want to mention last week I on in that episode called The Gay Revolution, which we'll put right here. Um, I mentioned that Alfred Kinsey in 1948, I, I, I went through the timeline of the, the gay revolution, the gay movement. And in 1948, I mentioned that Alfred Kinsey, the uh, zoologist, published the, this book called Sexual Behavior in the, the Human Male. And he concluded that homosexual behavior is not restricted to people who identify themselves as homosexual and that 37% of men have, quote, enjoyed homosexual activities at least once. Now, at the time when I did the video, I I knew that the this his... Uh, research was flawed, but I didn't know the extent of it. And so I just want to make an addendum to that statement that in his research, Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey did all sorts of crazy <laughs> research. And in, in the research on men, many of the men he surveyed were actually prison inmates. And the team, his team had taken sexual histories from about 1400 in prison sex offenders. So this is research from sex offenders in prison. And he he passed off the behavior as sexually, quote, normal, natural, and average. And so, uh, and a bunch of scientists came out after that, after the book was published, uh, reputable scientists, and, and said that his, his uh, statistic, statistics were deeply flawed. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that someone... Several of you emailed me about that, and I just wanted to clarify. Also, if you watched Matt Walsh's documentary called What is a Woman, uh, which is fascinating, <laughs> um, he he mentions Kinsey and, and how flawed Kinsey's research was. So I just wanted to get that out. So anyway, <clears throat> back to After the Ball. After the Ball was published in 1989. And I want to, as I said, I want to go through kind of the highlights that I gleaned from the book. And this, again, this was their, this was their manifesto. This was their strategy uh, to normalize homosexual behavior. And the, it's very, very, very persuasive. And all of this, all of what they say in their book, every, almost every single thing, well, actually every single thing has come to pass. So this manifesto worked. It was controversial at the time, but um, and you'll see why. But these guys were kind of like take no prisoners, sort of gay guys who wanted to manipulate and persuade America that homosexual behavior was normal. So I'm just going to go through uh, certain highlights of the book. In the beginning, they say in, in, in one of the chat, chapter three, they say, it's time to learn from Madison Avenue to roll out the big guns. Gays must launch a large scale campaign to reach straights through the mainstream media. We're talking about propaganda. That's a quote from the book. 
And then they go on to say the purpose and effect of pro-gay propaganda is to promote a climate of increased tolerance for homosexuals. And that, we say, is good. And they go on to say, propaganda relies more upon emotional manip manipulation than upon logic, since its goal is, in fact, to bring about a change in the, pu in the public's feelings. And again, remember, I've talked about this so many times on the show that movies and TV, it's, it's, it's such a strong form of persuasion because it manip manipulates your emotions. And so we're gonna, they get more into that in a minute, but <clears throat> how to use the media. And they say, in the battle for hearts and minds, effective propaganda knows enough to put its best foot forward. This is what our own media campaign must do. In February 1988, however, a war conference of 175 leading gay activists representing organizations across the land convened in Warrington, Virginia to establish a four-point agenda for the gay movement. The conference gave first priority to a nationwide media campaign to promote a positive image of gays and lesbians. And its final statement concluded, and I'm going to read this final statement from this conference. We must consider the media in every project we undertake. We must, in addition, take every advantage we can to include public service announcements and paid advertisements to cultivate reporters and editors of newspapers, radio and television. To help facilitate this, we will need national media workshops to train our leaders. Our media efforts are fundamental to the full acceptance of us in American life. So again, they know how that they need to manipulate the, the media, newspapers, television, ads, et cetera, radio. So they know that that's, that's very powerful. And of course, we know that's been done over the last, since this has been written since 1989. Um, and then it, it also says, these are some of the points. It says, number one, employ images that desensitize, jam, and or convert bigots on an emotional level. This is by far the most important task. So getting to your emotions is, is so important. That's why shows like, as, as I said, Will and Grace and, and Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, all those shows manipulate your emotions and, and movies like Brokeback Mountain and uh, uh, Har the Harvey Milk movie, all of those those movies manipulate. Oh, in the next point, they say challenge homo hating beliefs and actions on an intellectual level. Remember, the rational message serves to camouflage our underlying emotional appeal, even as it pairs away the surrounding latticework of beliefs that rationalize bigotry. And another point, they say, gain access to the kinds of public public media that will would automatically confer legitimacy upon these messages and therefore upon their gay sponsors. To be accepted by the most prestigious media, such as T network TV, our messages themselves will have to be, at least initially, both subtle in purpose and crafty in construction. Crafty, just like the devil. Um, and then it goes on, our media strategists must know their target audiences, know which are right for persuasion and which are not. And there's, they do this breakdown of intransigence on the one side and in the middle ambivalent skeptics and then on the other side, friends. So friends of the gay community, ambivalent people, and then people who refuse to budge. <laughs> And uh, they talk about which ones to go after. The intransigents are difficult, so they, they probably ignore those. And then they say, we conclude, therefore, that ambivalent skeptics are our most promising targets. So they want to go for that big group in the middle, ambivalent skeptics. And, um, and then they say, the main thing is to talk about gayness until the issue becomes thoroughly tiresome. <laughs> Does it feel like gayness has become thoroughly tiresome in our day? I mean, it's so exhausting. Even if I were still living that life, praise God, he rescued me out of that life. But even if I were still living that life, I would think this current epoch, this current era is so tiresome. 
It's so over the top and obnoxious. And then it goes on to say, first, gays can use talk to muddy the moral waters. That is to undercut the rationalizations that justify religious bigotry and to jam some of its psychic rewards. This entails publicizing support by moderate churches and raising serious theological objections to conservative biblical teachings. Has that happened? I think so. Uh, they, that has been very successful. So basically invade the church and get people to, to raise people like Matthew Vines to raise serious theological objections to conservative biblical teachings. And then it goes on to say, second, gays can undermine the moral authority of homo hating churches over less fervent adherence by portraying such institutions as antiquated backwaters, badly out of step with the times and with the latest findings of psychology. So again, they knew to attack the church. They, this, the plan was to, to infiltrate the church and attack it. And we see the results of that today. We see the fruit of that. It's, I mean, I don't even know what percentage of the church even believes that homosexual behavior is a sin still. Probably a small fraction at this point. I don't know. Because no one talks about it. No past pastors are not talking about this from the pulpit. Some are. Some courageous ones are. But everyone's silent on this issue. And uh, during the AIDS crisis, you know, with the ACT UP campaign, the whole slogan was silence equals death. Well, that's the same here. Silence equals death. If pastors aren't willing to talk about this subject, given the culture that we're in right now, given how powerful and all-consuming this issue is in our culture, if they're not willing to talk about it, many people, many millions of people are on the road to perdition or on the road to destruction and death, eternal death, because no one will talk about it. And then it goes on to say, it suffices here to recall that the visual media, television, films, and magazines are the most powerful image makers in Western civilization. So I, I, once again, I talked about that, you know, TV, movies, so influential in the way even Christians believe about this issue. For example, the average American household, the TV screen radiates its, its embracing bluish glow for more than 50 hours every week, bringing films, sitcoms, talk shows, and news reports right into the living room. These hours are a gateway into the private world of straits through which a Trojan horse might be passed. So again, using media as this Trojan horse, using Oprah Winfrey and the Ellen show and all these daytime talk shows and using them as the Trojan horse to normalize gay behavior. And of course, again, Satan is behind, uh, he's the architect behind this, these two architects. So these guys are being, uh, were manipulated by Satan, in my opinion. I mean, the, it's obvious that their, their master is Satan and they are <clears throat> doing his work and doing it well. Another principle says, in any campaign to win over the public, gays must be portrayed as victims in need of protection so that straights will be inclined by reflex to adopt the role of protector. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> gays must be portrayed as victims. So again, we see this whole victim mentality today, this uh, intersectionality, it's just all over the place. Uh, and so these guys knew what they were doing. These guys were smart. And then it says, the purpose of victim imagery is to make straights feel very uncomfortable. That is to jam with, I don't know why they use to jam all the time, but... <laughs> It must have been a, a term in the in the late 80s that is to jam with shame the self-righteous pride that would ordinarily accompany and reward their anti-gay belligerence and to lay 
groundwork for the process of conversion by helping straights identify with gays and sympathize, sympathize with their underdog status. So again, it's, it's persuading straights, as they say, to, to sympathize with gays. They go on. One could also argue that lesbians should be featured more prominently than gay men in early stages of the media campaign. Straights generally have fewer and cloudier preconceptions about lesbians and may feel less hostile towards them. Because gay men traditionally, historically, have been way more kind of out there and flamboyant and, you know, gay pride parades, all this stuff. So they're, they're saying we should use lesbian, we should feature lesbians first in this campaign, in the media campaign, because the culture will be more accepting. And then it goes on to say, now two different messages about the gay victim are worth communicating. First, the public should be persuaded that gays are victims of, of circumstance, that they are no, that they no more chose their sexual orientation than they did say their heights can color talents or limitations, which is, in, I mean, in my experience, I didn't choose to be same sex attracted uh, that it just, it developed in me. And it, again, it's a result of the fall. It's a result of probably a lot of things that happened in my childhood. I was molested. So, um, so in that regard, they're correct in that I, I didn't choose to be attracted. In fact, I didn't want to be attracted to, to guys, uh, when I was young, I did not want that. So, and then they say, we argue that for all practical purposes, gay should be considered to have been born gay, even though sexual orientation for most humans seems to be the product of a complex interaction between innate predispositions and environmental factors during childhood and early adolescence. So even in 1989, they were pushing this idea of born this way, born gay, born gay, born gay. They wanted to push that idea and, and they admit that sexual orientation is a product of a complex interaction of environmental factors and innate predisposition. So it's just bizarre that um, that they they know this, but they they push this this idea that everyone is born gay and kind of like that just shuts down the conversation. And again, even if I talked about this so many times on the show. Even if you're born gay, even if it's a hundred percent genetic, it doesn't, it's a moot point. It doesn't matter because we're all broken. It's the doctrine of total depravity. We're corrupted to the core. And so even our genetic coding is corrupted because of the fall of mankind. And so again, we all have innate impulses, sinful impulses. It doesn't mean we're, we act on them as Robert Gagnon would say. And then it goes on to say, and since no choice is involved, gayness can be no more blameworthy than straightness. So again, born this way is a huge <laughs> strategy. And then they go on to talk about gay pride parades and they say, we recommend a compromise. March if you must, but don't parade. Drop the Mardi Gras foolishness and assemble yourselves into a proud legion of freedom fighters like the civil rights marchers of the 1960s. Such marches would certainly enable gay self-affirmation, yet would be taken more seriously by straights. So they're basically saying, stop doing these gay pride parades that are so, um, so tawdry <laughs> and so just uh, sexual, sexualized. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a gay pride parade. I don't recommend it, but it's you will be shocked, very shocked at how sexual they are. Um, men with wearing basically nothing, basically doing strip teases on floats. And it's it's crazy. It's a crazy thing to watch. Even again, as I said, even when I was living that life, I just thought it was all so uh, debaucherous and obnoxious and unnecessary. And, uh, anyway, that that's what they're recommending to make it more of a March than a parade, but that didn't really work out. So 
And then they say, um, magazines are good vehicles for the gay message for several reasons. Magazine reading is a solitary pastime. The reader is generally paying attention and in a thoughtful frame of mind. <laughs> These are Harvard grads and I, like I, their, their writing is so goofy. I don't know uh, if they took writing classes or not. And then they talk about the difference between gay men and lesbians. And they say gay men and lesbians are apples and oranges. They happen to find themselves in the same barrel only because their society treats all fruits alike. And as I've talked about with Rosario Butterfield on the show, gay men tend to be kind of, uh, we talked about this, the difference between gay men and lesbians. Gay men were always kind of like, are, are hedonistic and uh, debaucherous and into you know drugs and alcohol this is my experience um i'm not saying all gay men are like this but in my experience of 20 years in that life that's what i saw uh and a lot and it was very pervasive and lesbians were more political activists and uh didn't you know weren't hedonists so that was the that's the kind of key difference between the two groups but they had to unite to further the agenda. And then they talk about AIDS when a when AIDS first came on the scene in San Francisco. And they actually critique what gays were doing back then. And it's they say it's hard to forget that by and large, the gay bathhouses of New York and San Francisco shut down, not as they should voluntarily, as soon as it became evident to a reasonable person that what they were selling was death. So gay bathhouses in New York and San Francisco, even during the beginning of the AIDS crisis, and when, when they knew that it was sexually transmitted, HIV, they refused to shut down the gay bathhouses. These bathhouses refused to shut down, and then finally they, they gave in and did did so. And then it, they go on to say, they go on to talk about relationships, uh, gay relationships, and they say relationships between gay men don't usually last very long. And I've talked about this before. The <laughs> relationships, all of my re relationships with guys, I went, I was in five serious relationships, lasted two years. They all lasted two years. They had the same shelf life, the same sine wave. It was like super, you know, exciting in the beginning and then it would taper off. And then there would be, after about a year, there would be infidelity and then it would just kind of go downhill from there. Not infidelity on my part, by the way. Uh, and so anyway, it go, they say, yet most gay men are genuinely preoccupied with their need to find a lover. In other words, everybody's looking and nobody's finding how to account for this paradox. And this is crucial. This is, and they admit this, this is interesting. They say part of this is due to the characteristics of male physiology and psychology, which make the sexual and romantic pairing of man with man inherently less stable than the pairing of man with woman. And in parentheses, they say, sorry, if the truth hurts, but it's true. When you put two men together, because of the physiology and the psychology of the two men, the relationship is very unstable. So what they're saying in a gay relationship, the two men, there's no compliment. There's no woman to balance that uh, the male side of it to um, what's the word to curb, to curb the man's um, libido as it were. So, um, and I've, that's why gay male relationships never last. And if they do last some, obviously some do, but so many that do last are open. And I have friends who are, are married, gay men who are married, my old friends, and they have open relationships. They have sex with other men all the time. It's completely acceptable. It says, the cheating ratio of married gay males given enough time approaches 100%. These are two gay guys and they're admitting that the cheating ratio is 100%. And that in my experience, that is 
absolutely the case. Absolutely. And they say men are, after all, as said earlier, more easily aroused than women who tend to act as a relatively stabilizing influence. A restless gay man is more apt to be led astray by a cute face in the subway or the supermarket. But it's true. It's um, I, I like how they put that. A, a woman is a relatively acts as a relatively stabilizing influence on a man. And that's true. That's why God, God knows what he's doing. That's why he, God put a man with a woman. And that's that's what how where sex is suppo supposed to be expressed within a covenant of marriage between one man, one woman for life. They go on many gay lovers bowing to the inevitable agree to an open relationship. That's what I've talked about. Uh, in my experience, all of my old gay friends have open who are committed to each other or married, quote unquote, have an open relationship. Um, it's just it's common, it's very common. On average, a woman's sex drive is less intense than a man's and less automatically aroused by visual cues. A woman is more sexually susceptible to her emotions than to what she sees. And these guys are smart. I mean, there's truth to that. There is truth to that. And so again, a woman is a, has a stabilizing effect on men. And they talk more about these open relationships between gay men. And they say that the lovers tend to become more collaborators on the prowl, helping each other look for tricks. That means guys to take home for a menage a trois. Uh, tricks are like prostitutes or whatever, um, or not, or just strangers. They say it is indeed our impression that when gay relationships last at all, it's in diluted form as the res result of some such accommodation though not usually one so blatant, but they don't usually last. Eventually one party heads for the door. So again, gay male relationships or homosexual relationships don't last. And Larry Kramer, if you remember from last week, I talked about him. He was he started the, the group ACT UP and during the AIDS crisis. He's basically the, the most prominent gay activist that ever lived. <clears throat> and he died in 2020 and uh he was very had very strong words for the gay community during the aids crisis and was telling them he basically scolded them for for their promiscuity even after they knew that this disease was sexually transmitted and so uh so the writers of this book say about larry kramer they say for trying to get gay men to believe what they prefer doggedly to ignore that AIDS is indeed spread sexually and that promiscuity had become a guarantee of early death. He was denounced by large numbers of New Yorkers as quote alarmist and quote sex negative. He was also accused of saying, I told you so quote unquote. The fact that he had every right to say it cut no ice. I don't know what that means. Eventually, he was driven out of the organization he helped create. So he was kicked out of ACT UP that he created. And this is what I was saying last week about Ronald Reagan. And because when Ronald Reagan was president, he was, um, you know, gays were so mad at him uh, about the AIDS crisis. And it's like I said this last week and it's like it's not Ronald Reagan's fault. <laughs> you guys know how you contract HIV, yet you continue to have unsafe sex. And so even when I was living that life, as I said before, I was like, it's not Ronald Reagan's fault. It's it's our, you know, it's the gay community's fault for not heeding this. And and I used to say this to my friends and my friends, we would talk about this back in the day in the 90s, 80s and 90s. We would we said that, you know, AIDS could be it was a curable disease. It could have been completely wiped out if gay men had just no longer had unsafe sex. It would have been eradicated like in a in a day. <laughs> but that wasn't the case. And 
So I just want to close on this um, because the reason this is this video and my videos are not for the gay community. They're not for non-believers, really. They're for believers. And if and if a gay, you know, if someone in the LGBT community sees a video of mine and comes to Christ, praise God. Like, that's amazing. But I just want to um, iterate, reiterate that this these videos are for believers. They're for Christians. And the reason I do these videos is to edify the church, to help Christians understand, because the we're being pressured by the world so strongly on this issue, on the LGBT issue. And so my goal is not to hate on gay people. I have nothing but love and compassion for the LGBT community. Um, Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. And those people are my neighbors. Uh, the other day I was at a juice shop, my juice shop, and uh I I was ended up talking to this gay guy. Uh, he was obviously gay, and I had nothing but love and compassion for him. There, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, God saved me. He plucked me out of that darkness and into light. And I want that to happen to other people in that community. So this video, these videos are not for non-believers, it really. It, they're for the church. And I, you know, I even have a friend who is in her late fifties and she's been in a Bible study for like 20 something years in the South with very conservative women. And she mentioned my name and my book in the Bible study. And they got into this heated discussion about homosexual behavior. And most of the women don't believe that it's a sin anymore. And it's just crazy to me. And that's, and they're Christian, they're, they're professing Christians. And so it's affecting everyone including people you would never imagine it would affect because of the power of the culture, because of the power of persuasion, because of after the ball. And so, again, I just want to acknowledge that I have nothing but love for the for people in that community. I was in that community for 20 years. I was in that community and God rescued me out of it. And so all we can do is love our gay LGBT neighbor and and pray for them. That's all we can do. And um, so I hope that helps. And thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you next week on The Becca Cook Show. Thank you.